This text is what I would call one of the classic texts of Scripture. It's well known. Uh, it's very, very familiar to us. I want to exhort you to not let famili familiarity be a thief to you. For God, like texts like God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him may not perish but have everlasting life. Those words can roll off our tongues while, frankly, our minds think about something else. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down by the green pastures. He makes me walk beside the still waters. Don't let familiarity be a thief. That's one of the complexities of, of the, the nature of flesh. We have, we have this coexistence of, of uh, soul and spirit. In, inside of us, we have a regenerated mind, but then the mind has a, or the flesh has a mind of its own, and there, there can be uh, some, some uh, anomaly, the relation between the old and the new, there's some anomaly that, that exists in that something very familiar can actually escape you. The profundity of something familiar can actually uh, escape you, and so I don't, I don't want to be uh, guilty of that myself. And I thought it would be in order to uh, give you a word of, of exhortation. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I've found, I've found some uh, jewels of truth in this text that I have been benefited by. And I trust that the Lord will, um, that you'll be benefited uh, by them as well. When you find, when you find a treasure and you want find something of great value you want to share you want to you want other people to find what to know what you found and I, I feel like I've uh, I've found some some good things in this text and so I'll trust the Lord to help me to uh, communicate those things uh, to you revelation always makes an impact when the Lord makes truth known it always has an impact that impact may vary in different people. The two people hear the same revelation and to one, one person says, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And another person says, thou hast the words of eternal life. Right. So this, those two different impacts are nothing new. It's always, it's always been this way. The Lord has always been a revelator and what he reveals always makes an impact, either to the salvation or to the damnation. Either It makes people either turn the face to the Lord or turn the back against the Lord. But either way, it always has an impact. The truth of God can't be made known to no effect. It will always have an effect. When God reveals, it leaves no one the same. You'll either become more sensitive to the Lord or more hardened against the Lord when something is revealed to you. You're not going to stay the same. See, it seems like in our day the urgency of the revealed gospel has got away from people. The fact that truth is available makes people responsible for knowing what has been made known. If, if, a, if a society or a person uh, just of their own decision decides to uh, stay ignorant of the advances of medicine and what's available, then they won't be benefited by what's available. And so um, as common as that analogy sounds, any person who uh, chooses to be ignorant of what, is, what has been made known, they won't be benefited by what has been, what's been made known. Everyone in this way, when, as God works in the earth, everyone either ends up in Pharaoh's army or Moses' camp. So when God worked in that day, it was to the ruin of Egypt and it was to the salvation of Israel and everyone ended up in one camp or the other. <clears throat> Revelation impacted Abraham to such an extent that he left his own country and he left his family and he went to a land that was promised him. He says, I'll give this land to you and to your descendants. And he left 
And the scripture says he didn't receive any inheritance in it, not so much as to put his foot in. He was a sojourner, but the revelation impacted him so much that he was content to be a sojourner. And in fact, he was such a, the, the land was promised to him. So you, you might think, if you're a, a person unfamiliar with the ways of God, you might think that Abraham would have just marched into Canaan and just taken over. This is my land. God said it was going to be given to me and to my, uh, to my posterity, but it didn't work like that. It took there a lot of time for the purpose of God and the promises of God to unfold and to actually come to reality, to come to fruition. So to such an extent that Abraham had to buy a plot of land to bury Sarah in when, act, when according to the purpose of God, it was all his. God had promised it all to him. It didn't appear that way, but the revelation of God's purpose had so impacted Abraham that he was just content to be a sojourner because he'd been impacted by the truth. Revelation so impacted Saul of Tarsus that he was, Paul the apostle, was unrecognizable as having used to have been Saul of Tarsus. It didn't appear to be the same man at all. He threw whatever was gained to him, he counted it all loss. He threw away his heritage, he threw away his um, what we might call a career, a religious career as, as, as it was, but he, he threw it all away, he abandoned it, he walked the other way. Uh, what, what would convince Saul of Tarsus to do this? It was the revelation of the truth. The revelation impacted him to such an extent that he thought completely different than the way he used to think. He saw things completely different than the way he used to see them. He estimated and valued things completely different because what was gain is now loss. What he once knew nothing about, now he pressed forward to lay, to lay hold of the prize that, that laid before him. So this was not just a psychological paradigm. The, the impact of the revelation of God cannot be emulated by psychology. Amen. That's right. Amen. And it, it, as obvious as that may seem, there, people, people flock and follow this assumption in droves, thinking that just a, psycholo- just a, just a little uh, psychological um, difference, just to look at things different, that'll be, that's what I need. I need, to, I need this shift, I need this change. If I just think this way, if I just develop this habit, then the, the new birth cannot be emulated. Yeah. To be born again... You, God's seed has to remain in you. And for all things to become new, revelation ha- the revelation of the gospel has to capture, has to capture your uh, attention. The revelation of the gospel so impacted the apostles that they said, to whom shall we go while other people were walking away? They saw in Jesus what the multitudes didn't see. They thought Jesus was talking about cannibalism. And particularly to the Jewish the Jewish mind, the, Jew, the Jews were cultured by the law, of course, that you didn't eat blood of any kind, to say nothing of human blood. And now it sounds like Jesus, what he taught just, just for the face value of the words themselves, Jesus was teaching cannibalism. And I've heard people say that th- just the words he, the, going back to the original doesn't open that text up because the words he used means flesh. When he said flesh, that means in the Greek, it means flesh. But they so impacted the apostles that they wouldn't follow anybody else. Revelation of the gospel has impact. So why won't people give up the world? Because they haven't been impacted by the gospel. Why can't people deny themselves? They keep seeking after their own. And it's because they haven't been impacted by the gospel. That's the explanation. You judge a tree by its fruit. You you can't take a profession at face value. You judge a tree by its fruit. You look at what's growing and you know the nature of the tree by what the tree produces. So if it produces flesh, then what is it? It's flesh. And if it produces spirit, then it came from God. That's the only, that's the only possible uh, explanation. The, uh, think about how, how the revelation of Jesus impacted the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Brethren, men and brethren, what shall we do? And things changed. They saw Jesus differently than they'd, than they'd seen him before because it had been revealed, it impacted, and it changed the way they thought. It, in, in consequence of that, it changed the way that they conducted themselves before God and men because the revelation of the gospel has an impact. So here's the revelation taught 
in this text of Hebrews chapter 4 is that we have a high priest, and so how does this impact you? You can come to God. That's the impact. That's the consequence of Jesus being our high priest is that you can come to God and not, not just come to God and, and hope that he glances your way with some, uh, some thought of favor or at least mercy. You can come boldly and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Just notice the, just note the confidence. We're not coming to God in ambiguity. We're not coming to God to see, like um, Queen Esther went before the king not knowing the outcome. This is not how we come to God in Christ. We, we come boldly because we know that Jesus has been received, so will be received. We know Jesus is heard, so will be heard. We know Jesus received grace, so will receive grace. That's why we come boldly. We're not coming, we're not coming in hopes. Let us, therefore, men need to hear about the benevolent nature of the gospel. You know, the gospel, I don't mean to always be using a negative contrast, but the, the, the gospel is viewed as like aspirin. You just need a little bit just every once in a while. <laughs> the gospel is good. The gospel is benevolent. Verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 4 says, let us therefore enter into that rest. It's for our advantage. The gospel is for our advantage. The gospel appeals to man's desire to be advantaged. Everyone knows that people are, are interested in their own advantage. And this may, this may sound uh, like heresy, but uh, he, hear me out on this. Man, God appeals to man's desire to be advantaged, Amen. to be to, for gain. Did not Jesus say, lay up treasures for yourself in heaven? Amen. What was that but an appeal to man's desire for gain and for advantage? We are made in the image of God. Animals live to exist, and they exist to live. There is no uh, innate understanding or desire in animals for, for value, for, what, for something of greater value than something else. There's no sense in, a, in the mind of an animal to sacrifice, on one hand, for the prospect of advantaging later. There is no sense of hope. There is no sense of, of patient waiting, not for an animal. Men are made in the image of God. Men, like Abraham, he sensed he, he had an understanding of the advantage of the promise of God, so he was willing to be content to be disadvantaged in prospect of the promise of God. Because he, he saw the, the, the uh, advantageous nature of God's promises, that God had promised to advantage him, mm -hmm. and to, he promised him something that was desirous. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, uh, he sought for it. When... Uh, Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he bore his heart uh, open before the, the Philippians, which he couldn't do to all the churches. Some of them, you know, he's, I'm afraid of you and <clears throat> I have doubt of you. But to the Philippians, he said, I press toward the mark for the prize. There are people who, would, who counsel other, other believers to not talk about rewards. Yeah. Yeah. You should serve God because you ought to. Well, in a sense, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> because we are debtors. We are debtors to the Lord. But Jesus talked about a prize. Uh, John talked about a prize. Uh -huh. David talked about the, an advantage. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And so we should just, we should just adopt the language of Scripture rather than the language of men. Amen. Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize. Because frankly, what God has promised is better than what the world has offered. The, what the gospel has offered is better than what Satan has offered. Someone said, that, it was Sister Sydney just this morning, that, that uh, Satan packages up evil things in, in, inside a, a garb of what, what looks good, but when you actually get, when you get it, it doesn't deliver what it promised. Oh. Jesus, what, the gospel delivers more than what it appeared at the first. Amen. <clears throat> So when the man, when the man found the, the uh, treasure in the field, I love these parables that Jesus told several, 
of these parables in succession about the, the pearl of great price and the treasure hidden in the field and the, the net dra- drug through the, uh, through the water and the, the woman seeking through the house for the coin and, the, and the, the, the leaven that was needed through the bread and all these. And there wasn't a lot of details. He said a man found a treasure hidden in the field. Well, did he have an indication of where the treasure was? Or was he on a lifelong quest of finding hidden treasure that had been lost? We don't know those details. We do know he found a treasure and he knew that it was worth everything else that he had. And, and we draw this conclusion that he figured there's probably more treasure in the field because he didn't just buy the treasure out of the field. He bought the whole, tre- he bought the whole field. Right. Why did he sell all that he had to buy the field? Because he estimated that that was to his advantage. That was, it was more desirable for him to exchange everything that he had at the present for everything that he had just found. And he wasn't disappointed. Hope doesn't disappoint. Amen. And people are getting the idea in the church that, that the gospel is just like, a, it's just like a, a, an underwriter. Just in case something bad happens, I have this, this, uh, this gospel back here that kind of, it'll kick in if this all, if, if this all um, turns out bad in the end, then I, I, I have this, this, uh, this, this policy <laughs> that I, I may have to cash it in. Because I really don't know how, how it's all going to turn out. Well, we do know how it's all going to turn out. Because we're tasting of the first fruits of the Spirit now. We are tasting of the powers of the world to come now. No one's going to give up their life in this world just for some ambiguous idea. That's what, that's what has given birth to this, these phrases like pie in the sky, by and by. I really disdain and these are, and Christian people use phrases like this. You get the idea that heaven is just a perpetual state of normal. Brother Mike, he talked, he said something about this a, a while back. The prayer lists, common prayer lists, are kind of just I want my life to be normal. Well, it's, that just falls short. That's not becoming of the gospel of of Christ Jesus and the throne of grace. Let us, therefore, the gospel is an offering of advantage. Not, not advantage, not political or social advantage, not financial advantage, ultimate advantage. It, Jesus says, it's, when the, when he, he said several times, I go to my father, and this bothered the disciples. They didn't understand. They were, they were thinking of restoring the kingdom like a military uh, conquest. Because they were subservient to the Romans at this time, and so and their entire uh, their entire heritage going back all the way Solomon and David and and the judges uh, Samuel there there was always this this conflict between uh, nations, and so it was a it was a it was a social and a political uh, struggle, and so it was similar to that when Jesus was in the world that the Romans were were um, were really governing. Pilate was a Roman governor, not Jewish. And so he said, I go to the Father, and they were, it, they were trying to sort this out in their minds. How can, it, how can it be that all things come to pass when Jesus leaves? I thought he was going to establish, establish the kingdom. In other words, overthrow the Romans. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. The, uh, the older versions say expedient. The, like NIV and New American Standard, they say it's better. It's better for you that I go away. And they had a, this was elusive to their understanding. They had a hard time grasping this. How is it better that Jesus go away? They were probably thinking in terms of the questions that were asked. They didn't have any idea how to answer these questions. How could it be better that he go away? We don't know how to answer these questions. We can't heal the, the, the blind man. We can't raise Jairus' daughter. How is it better that he go away? He was comforting them with the prospect of an advantage. It's better... For you that I go to the Father, then come here. Brother Bob made this point. This is good. Only, at any one time, only one of, one of the three uh, persons in the Godhead can be in earth. <laughs> it was God's foot that touched Mount Sinai. Jesus came as the Word, and now He sent the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. And so now the, the Holy Spirit has come. It's better for us that He go away. It has been better yeah, amen. that He go away. So the... The message of the gospel is that God will do you better than the world. That's one way to put it. God will do you better than men. God, the gospel is, is good news. We can, therefore, 
let us hear the, hear the personal uh, the, the personal offering in this text. Let us come bold. It's not that this is just good for everybody else. It's good for us. He's a high priest for us. Let us, therefore, come boldly. Unlike Aaron, the first high priest, he didn't come boldly. He came in fear and in trepidation. He didn't come into the tabernacle, the most holy on the day of, uh, of atonement, the highest day of the year, when rivers of blood were running from the hundreds, maybe thousands of animals that were sacrificed on this, the highest day of the Jewish year. He did not come boldly. He came with fear. Moses on the mount said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Moses did not stand before the presence of God boldly. He stood in fear. They've stood in fear of death. Aaron entered in fear of making a mistake. There were provisions made for dragging the high priest out if he was struck dead because they did not serve boldly. They served in fear. And now we have this word written to Hebrew people. Let us come boldly to God. This is a new thing. Don't let this escape your attention that the gospel affords you a bold standing before God. Amen. You can stand before God boldly, not, not casually. That's right. Bold doesn't mean that you can, like you just have a ticket, uh -huh. and your ticket's always good, and your ticket can just be used over and over again, and you can always go to the front of the line. People, these, these ideas, of, these common thoughts have to be expelled out of your mind. When, you're, right. when you're, you approach God, you, there is nothing common about a man approaching God. At, in the gospel, we can, approach, we can approach boldly. This is the God who said, I will by no means acquit the guilty. And he still says that today. Yes. So how do you approach a God whom his closest ministers, Moses and Aaron, were fearful. How do you approach this God? He said, I will by no means acquit the guilty, but you know that you are guilty. But in the gospel, we can come boldly because he's dealt with your guilt. He's dealt with your sin effectively. Our God is a consuming fire. This is the God that, we, that we're talking about coming to. We're coming to a God who is a consuming fire. And what is consumed is anything and everything without exception that's unlike Him. That's right. Amen. It's not like God sometimes is a consuming fire. See, when we talk about men, sometimes I'm this way or sometimes I'm that way. It, might, it depends on the, on the experiences of the day. We are, our experiences in life are diverse. God doesn't, the, the Father doesn't have varying experiences in life. Our, our life, our God's not a man. So he is a consuming fire, always. But we come boldly. We can come boldly to God who is a consuming fire. Think about this. The fear of the Lord is just the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end. This is just where things start. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We never get so close to God we never get so close to Christ that we grow out of fearing God. This is, not, this is not even a possibility. We never become so familiar with God that we can just kind of, that the rules kind of bend. Or that we can just kind of be casual and unconcerned. Christ never brings, you, brings any person to that, to that point. We can come boldly in Christ. If you come outside of Christ, you'll, you are anything but bold. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So bold is not assuming. See, there, I, can, I go to work boldly because I, I kind of know the way things are going to be. I've been doing it for a long time now and I seldom see things that I haven't seen before every once in a while, but I am, I'm pretty confident at work because things are familiar. You don't come to God enough times that you can assume because God is still a consuming fire. And He will still today by no means acquit the guilty. 
God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't respect a person because they're in Christ. Still is no respecter of persons. Even in Christ, you have to come with Christ, believing, have faith, be washed before you can come to Christ, before you can come to God in Christ. There's no respect of persons. So we come boldly on the merits of Christ. That's why we come boldly, because, because He is received. We, we don't come boldly because in our own persons. We're, we come boldly because we're with Him. Because we're represented. Our boldness is a represented boldness. <laughs> because we have, we have a high priest. Because He's received, we are received. Because He is heard, we are heard. Now there's some particulars here. Therefore, <clears throat> let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That's not the end of the statement. That's not the end of the verse. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. See, and Brother Ricky has said a lot about this, and I appreciate this in the last year or so, maybe more, that you've, uh, generalities are not your friend. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may re- obtain mercy and, re- and find grace to help in time of need. There's some, there's some details there. Amen. And I, I want to get to this, but we're not... It, it's not just coming to see what's there. Coming to obtain mercy. Amen. That's like the first item on the list. We come to obtain mercy and we find grace. And that's different than finding grace or finding mercy and obtaining grace. Have you thought about why did he say obtain mercy and find grace? What's the difference between obtaining and finding? Why do we not f- find mercy? And obtain grace. Well, I have some thoughts I want to share with you about that. But they, we're coming to a throne. Don't forget that. Yeah, that's right. We're coming to a throne of grace. That's, and it's also a throne of judgment. It's, all, it's also it's, it's a throne of, of fire. Grace is not the only thing there. But we find it to be a throne of grace when we come with Jesus. Amen. Only if you come with Jesus... Do you find it to be a throne of grace? If you go, if you vent, if you go with Moses, it's not a throne of grace. If you go with Plato, philosophy, it's not a throne of grace. If you go with the wisdom of man in whatever package, you don't find a throne of grace if you go in the wisdom of man. If you go with Christ, it's always a throne of grace. And this is the only throne of grace that exists. There aren't any other thrones of grace. There are other thrones, but not thrones of grace. He has the only one. There are, you know, there are a lot of things that God has the monopoly on. He has the monopoly on truth. He has the monopoly on light. He has the monopoly on the gospel. He has a monopoly on forgiveness. He has a monopoly on redemption. And he has a monopoly on grace. There are no other thrones of grace. There may be other offerings. There may be other claims. But there are no other thrones of grace. So if you approach by law or Moses, then it's a throne of judgment. Because that's the only thing Moses can do is judge you. If you come in the throne of of wisdom, or if you come in the, the wisdom of man then it is a throne of mystery because no one finds him out. You've experienced this, that you come in with the the tools of the wisdom of man, God remains a mystery. But when you come with Christ, it is a throne of grace. It's completely different. So this is not a political throne, although people have tried to make it that way. It's not a throne of psychology. There are attempts in, in those areas too. And contemporarily, we should say, this is not a throne of your dreams. Yeah. Amen. It's not a throne of social resolutions. Who made me a judge and a ruler over you? Well, you know, all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him. 
All judgment's been given to the Son. And then Jesus said, who made me a ruler and a judge over you? Well, technically from, from one point of view, he was their ruler and their judge, except that he refused to manage those kind of issues. He ignored them. Because it's not a... So, it's not, this is a throne of grace. It's not a social throne. In other words, God's throne is completely dedicated to God's purpose, not yours. You don't bring your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations to the throne of God and solicit for an underwriting investment. You won't even get there. To say nothing of receiving a hearing. He doesn't consider. It's a throne of grace, which means His throne is completely dedicated to His work. And so we will only be able to approach His throne when we're involved in His work. When we are a prospect for His work, then we can come to His throne. It's a throne of grace. The provisions of the throne of grace thrive inside the purpose of God. The provisions of the throne... Grace speaks of provision. It's what God gives and the, so the throne of grace, provision, the provisions of grace come out of the throne and are dedicated to what God's doing in Christ, in the world. Now this word, these, these two words, we come to obtain mercy and find grace. Now I, have, I had never thought of the distinct, the technicalities of why the Holy Spirit chose these words and, it, and these associations, that we obtain mercy and find grace. So here's, these are kind of like brand new thoughts that I'm, and I, I'd be interested in, in hearing maybe in the comments afterwards uh, some of your uh, thoughts and input on this matter. There are, you know, in areas of, there's other areas of the truth where my bag is deeper, like in the areas of the new birth and the new man and the conviction of sin. These are areas of the, of the gospel that I'm more familiar with. I've tread, I've tread those ground, that ground uh, more times, and so I, my, my thoughts are, are uh, more matured in those areas. But here, the difference between obtaining mercy and finding grace. This is like a, this is like a meadow that I haven't been in yet. So here's, here's some, of the, some of the new thoughts that I've had in, the, in this regard. We knew that we needed mercy. He knew that we needed grace. Yeah. Obtain mercy. You obtain something when you have a, this, this deep-seated aspiration for it and you go after, I know I needed mercy because Moses taught me that I was a sinner. I knew I needed mercy. But when I came, he knew I needed grace. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad for the confirmation of the brother because I, 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 kept, I kept thinking about this. And I, there's a difference. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit said it this way. I obtained mercy. Think about it this way. The, the uh, blind men cried out for mercy. They didn't cry out for grace. The son of David, have mercy on us. As they cried over and over again and people told them to be quiet and they wouldn't and they got what they asked for. They obtained mercy. But they didn't say, Son of David, give us grace. Grace is His prerogative. Yes. We obtain mercy, but then when we obtain it, it's more than what we thought. We find grace. There's more there than what we thought. Right. Amen. So while we were seeking to receive mercy, Jesus was seeking to give grace. Why does a person seek for mercy? Probably because Jesus is seeking to give grace. We love Him because He first loved us. And so we find, after sitting in the, in the seat of Moses, in that, uh, like a one-room classroom, everybody learns in the same room. You come down, you sit in Moses' classroom, Amen. and it's like there's one, there's one, it's a one-test question. And when you say, God be merciful to me, a sinner then you've graduated out of Moses' classroom. So when you learn that you're a sinner, then, then mercy becomes, that becomes prime, uh, prime, prime 
material of desire. I want mercy because I've learned that I'm a sinner. What does a sinner need but mercy? He needs mercy, but he needs a lot more than what he's learned so far. Haven't you, as you continue to walk with the Lord, haven't you realized you discover more need? There's my needs bigger than what I thought. Now you're finding grace. You obtain mercy and you find grace. The abundance, so you find that the, the abundance of his throne is much greater than what you thought. As you're coming, as you're, as you're coming with a this fresh sense of this fresh conviction, you know you're a sinner, you deserve nothing but condemnation, you come asking for mercy. You you think you know that your your need is great just at that point, but then you're you learn how great your need really is, and you learn how abundant the provision of the throne really is. Amen. So finding finding grace. This is the last thing I have on this. Finding grace has more to do with <clears throat> the Lord's discretion in working in you than it does with your understanding of your own condition. You find grace. Don't you, <clears throat> don't you think, don't you understand that as we come to the Lord and ask for help in time of need, that He knows our need greater than we do? We know our children's needs greater than they do. I understand. I understand the need for discipline, for instruction. I know th their need is much greater than what they think it is. And so my response to their request might not be exactly what they wanted. But they don't understand the real issues and how deep-seated the need really is. So finding grace has to do with the Lord's <clears throat> discretion. Amen. Brother Fred had something, to, um, a phrase that he used about the Lord giving grace that I, and I remember hearing this, I listened to uh, the, the messages on faith. I know that the faith, of, the faith of God's elect, I think is what it's called. I know a lot of you have listened to it too. It's like six, 12 messages on faith that Brother Fred preached. And in one of those messages, he says that, uh, Grace is given at his discretion, not at mine. And that's, that's what I find in this text. Is we come knowing that we need mercy, but when he meets us there, <clears throat> then we find grace. Because he knows, he knows much more. Now, in conclusion, <clears throat> in a time of need, to find, find or obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, our need needs to find. What is your need? Men have always had problem defining what their need really is. It's almost like, <clears throat> this is another anomaly, every man knows that they're needy, but not every man knows what their need really is. <clears throat> it's, um, thank you. And so the, go the gospel first has to define our need before it meets our need. Time of need. Mankind has always had, always had this trouble. So it's, in, it's only in the light of the gospel that you can look in and really see what's there. <clears throat> and find out what your need is. <clears throat> here's, an, here's an example of different, <clears throat> different scales of need being used. If you ask in different interrogations, you ask someone who qualifies in the U.S. for po poverty, they're in the poverty class of the U.S. Ask them, what's your greatest need? And you write that down. <clears throat> and you go to Sudan, and you find a poor person, and you ask that poor person in Sudan, what's your need? You write it down. Those two answers don't look the same. And you could do that at, <clears throat> on a lot of different scales. <clears throat> because a person's present, or what their supposed present <clears throat> existence is will define what their need is. Same with rich. What is rich? There, <clears throat> I've heard this, this uh, statistic before that if you have a $5 bill in your pocket right now, you are one of the rich people in the world today. 
because the majority of the world doesn't have enough to eat today. <clears throat> and you have $5 in your pocket. So the poor in Sudan would leap at the chance to be poor in the U.S. Because he defines his need in terms of clean water and food that won't kill me. That's his need. And what does the, the poverty class in America, how do they define their need? It might very well have to do with automobiles and job responsibilities and electronic devices. It might very well. <clears throat> Time of need. I didn't need any more. Thank you. Our time of need. Now, there, our need in general terms can, can be defined at least in three different areas. Body, soul, and spirit. Because we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And obtaining mercy does have to do with give us this day our daily bread. That's finding mercy. That's obtaining, obtaining mercy. But then there's a soulish need too. Our physical needs are obvious. We have to eat and drink and sleep. Those, that's really need. Those are our physical needs. We have to eat, we have to drink, and we have to sleep. And you, you can get into more particular, like breathing, you know. Our needs are, we need to breathe. Those are obvious needs, but then there are soulish needs that are only felt. You have needs that I can't see. You'd have to tell me. They're soulish needs. You don't want to be naive about these things. Brother Bob mentioned someone this morning that <clears throat> told him that once you come to Christ, then everything's happy from here on out. There are a lot of pretenders like this. So you don't want to pretend. You do have soulish needs. Yeah. Laughing and crying are soulish. We're soulish beings, and you have soulish needs, and they're only felt needs. And quite frankly, we need help in identifying what those needs are. Because psychology will tell you. Philosophy will tell you, and they'll lead you astray. Weep with them that weep. Don't, haven't you realized that's a ministry? Yeah. Weeping is, it's not only soulish, I know, but it is soulish, isn't it? Yeah. It's an emotion. There's a very, and there, but it's connected to very deep-seated spiritual realities. Yeah. It's not only soulish, and it's not only spiritual, they connect. And in, in fact, in that way, it connects to your body, too. So there are felt needs, there are obvious needs, that are physical, there are felt needs that are spiritual, and then there are unknown needs that are, spir that are uh, soulish, I'm sorry, physical, soulish, and spiritual, and spiritual needs are unknown to me and to you until they're revealed, and grace to help is what supplies unknown needs. Remember when Brother Given was teaching through Romans chapter 8? And the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot express. When we don't know how we ought to pray. And I was one of those who it probably, probably everyone at some time thought that what that text is talking about is, I have this need and I just don't know how to pray about it. No, you have needs you don't know. It's not that you don't know how to pray about it. You have needs that you haven't even met with yet. You don't even know they're there. So now how do you find need? Help in time of need. So doesn't, it, it's, doesn't that redefine needy people? We are very needy people. That, I know that, ha, that phrase has a bad connotation to it in the, in the world today. He's a very needy person. Well, everyone's a very needy person. So the gospel had to define our unknown needs. So in a general sense... We are always in a time of need. Always. If Jesus for one moment didn't intercede for us, it's open season. The, the uh, wicked one and his cohorts would not miss the opportunity. The devil knew that there was a hedge around Job. So in a general sense, there's always a time of need all, because we're in the body and because of the nature of the flesh and because we're in, a world, in the world and because of the devil. So on all of these accounts, we're always in need. We're always needing help. But then there are also very specific, intense times of need. So this is one of those texts that have, that when you, you read this text when, on a, when you're on the mountain, you're having a mountaintop day. You read this text, I've been helped in the time of need. That's why I'm on the mountaintop. Well, then you read it when you're in the valley, 
When you read this text, a help in time of need, doesn't need sound different? Because, they're, because it doesn't always mean the same thing. When your, your conviction, the Holy Spirit doesn't stop convicting you. He came to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And see, the first things, he starts, John Bunyan had a very, uh, very picturesque way of putting that. When the Holy Spirit comes to convict the new sinner, then he, he makes broad strokes of conviction. Just he, can, he said it in some way like he can swing any way he wants and hit something. That's what he said. He can convict of this, convict of that. But then as you, as you progress, you mature in the Lord, then the Holy Spirit gets more meticulous in his conviction. Same with our need. When we come to Him, we know we need mercy when we come to the Lord. But then the, the, the longer we walk with the Lord, we learn more and more what our needs are. So there are particular times of need like Peter's temptation. Peter always needed the Lord's help. He always needed the Lord's intercession. But on that night, there was an intense need that he didn't have before. And the Lord foresaw this coming and prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. That was a time of need, unlike other times Amen. of need. Uh, Stephen stoning, that was a time of need. He, Stephen got grace in that time that he didn't have before. That was a time of need where he saw the Lord and he prayed for his killers. That was a time of need. He got grace that there's, I think there's probably a, 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 a special category of grace for dying. And he got dying grace that day. That was a time of need. John on the island of Patmos, that was a time of need, different than other times. Jesus in the garden, sweat great drops of blood, there's, that was a different time. <clears throat> you don't want to be naive and simplistic in your approach to life. I just need, I just need this allotment of grace every, every day and things will be fine. There are, not every day is the same. Not every hour is the same. There is an hour of temptation. Not every moment is the same. There's a time of need. Well, I, I trust that the Lord can, can minister some of those things to you. And I'm, I'm thankful for just how the Lord says things. I know that I've, can, I've uh, expressed this before that I am oftentimes, it's not an uncommon experience for me to be frustrated with, with how I can't articulate something. I want to I want to say say it just this way and my words fall short of my thoughts and my but the Lord doesn't have that frustration. He says it exactly the way it needs to be said and I'm I'm uh I'm just I'm grateful for the the word of God and for just just the way it is. Amen.